Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Frank McNally, Public Spend Forum and GovShop. Uh, we have a, a very important, we think, uh, webinar for you this afternoon on force majeure and understanding your rights and responsibilities as a government contractor impacted by COVID-19. We're gonna let everyone have a moment and actually see there's participants logging in already. Uh, so as folks get settled, we want to make a few announcements. <clears throat> we are live streaming this for the very first time on Facebook in an effort to spread this message. And, um, oh, looks like I have to add a, a title. Here we go. We're gonna go live anyway. And Yanisa, if you want uh, to get over into the, to the Facebook and maybe just put some context around this, this would be great. But let's focus on our Zoom for now um, and the webinar topic, which we have today. Uh, understanding your rights and responsibilities as a government contractor impacted by COVID-19. We have um, a very good panel today, and I want to get to that, to that as soon as possible. So while folks are getting settled in, I'm just going to go over a few uh, uh, key things about Public Spend Forum and GovShop, just to understand who we are. But Public Spend Forum is a market intelligence and procurement innovation platform for the public sector. We uh, ideally make public sector markets easier to access across the world through open government markets. Uh, we have a resource, uh, several resources, um, tools and services that we offer the community to uh, help suppliers and buyers connect, uh, GovShop, GovAirs, and GovLabs. We'll talk about these more in future webinars, but I think the content today is, is most important. Um, and for that, we've convened a, a, partner, a, a panel of experts, and I'm gonna have them all introduce themselves uh, and starting with our host for the webinar today, Ben McMartin, Managing Partner at Public Spend Forum. Ben? Frank, thanks. Thanks for leading that off. Uh, first of all, um, I'm super excited about this panel. Um, we set it up about uh, a week ago and we have, we have called audibles all, last, all throughout the week to make sure we stayed on top of it. Uh, but just super short about me, I am Managing Partner of the Public Spend Forum. Public Spend Forum's mission is uh, to support open government markets. And that means providing equal access of information between all vendors and government to make sure that we are humming at a alternative acquisition method pace, meaning quickly. Um, and I'm super excited to bring on three folks today. John Williams is a partner at Pilero Maza. Um, Mark Rees, who is a senior counsel at Government Contracts Group at Kroll and Mooring, who's had me come out and speak on multiple things on this topic. I appreciate them. And Elizabeth Jokum is a partner at Smith Pactor McWhorter. Um, and I will let them tell you what they specifically do in their jobs, which I'm sure is super awesome. Um, one disclaimer up front that I'll put in for everybody. While this is a panel of attorneys, we are not a panel of your attorneys. Uh, we are going to discuss some very important items and their legal significance. However, nothing should be constituted as direct legal advice to anybody listening today. Um, you should consult with your own attorney on matters that are specific to your issues and contract issues. Um, and hopefully stuff that you learn today will be a good starting point for that. Um, so, John, if we could pass it over to you. Sure, thanks, Ben. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're not your lawyers yet, but we would be happy to talk with you about uh, the situations you're encountering. And we're getting a ton of questions on the, the uh, impacts of COVID-19. So I think this is a really timely topic. I'm a partner in the government contracts group at Polero Maza, uh, and we're representing small, medium, and, and large contractors and everything you, you deal with. And unfortunately, right now, th this is really issue number one, isn't it? Yeah, and Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ben, and uh, and happy to be here and and to to reconnect uh, on your side um, after uh, after our Army days and uh, uh, and your participation in some of our events. Um, as Ben mentioned, uh, I'm an Army vet, uh, 20 year Army guy. Now flipped to the other side of the fence, uh, helping government contractors navigate uh, wonderful issues such as uh, such as dealing with the fallout of uh, pandemics, uh, a, a relatively recent addition uh, to the repertoire. Uh, happy to be here and looking forward to it. Thanks, Ben. 
All right. And Elizabeth, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you have going on? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy to be here with this great group. I'm a partner in the government contracts group of Smith Pactor McWhorter, and my practice focuses on uh, just general counseling and litigation for government contractors, including bid protests and claims. And uh, as we'll get to, I think there's plenty coming down uh, at the pike here in terms of requests for equitable adjustments and claims relating to COVID-19 and um, suspensions and similar issues surrounding government contracts. So we will touch on all these issues in the next hour. All right, fantastic. All right, so we have the panel of experts to talk about this topic today, and we're very excited to bring this information to you. So how did we get here? Uh, let me give a little uh, summary of how we got here. Well, about, uh, let's say, 10 days ago to a week ago, somewhere in that uh, instance, um, a lot of our friends public, at Public Spend Forum who operate in that environment of bringing together government and industry, um, we're planning on hosting a lot of government agencies down at South by Southwest. Um, and as more information rolled out on the coronavirus, people started to make initial steps to, to uh, cancel their participation, um, obviously out of, out of the public's health interest. Um, and then South by Southwest was canceled outright. Um, and what we found was we had a lot of companies who are sitting in between a government contract and a series of commercial contracts in which they had rights, responsibilities, duties, and liabilities, both to the government and both to commercial uh, entities. And we thought, okay, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna bring some experts together, we really wanna talk about the impact of coronavirus and what that means both on commercial and government contracting side, because it does come out differently. Um, in some certain situations. And so as of seven days ago, that was the game plan. Let's talk about how, how these contracts work out um, in these current situation um, with companies who are taking wise steps to maybe repudiate some terms of a contract. Um, and then eventually they didn't have a choice anyways as, as the conference uh, canceled anyways. Um, since then, We've seen so many different cancellations. The environment has changed so much in seven days. I can tell you I am doing this uh, webinar virtual panel from my house with my three school age children upstairs trying to be as quiet as they possibly can uh, while dad's working, which I'm sure a lot of people are right now. Um, so things have drastically changed um, and there are a number more issues than we thought we would cover, but we're gonna try to cover as many as possible today. Um, so with that context, we're going we're gonna to definitely cover down on the stuff that has come up to us already, including uh, events, you know, uh, issues such as, you know, cancellation of events and how that impacts your uh, government and commercial contracts. Um, but let's go ahead and get off to the races on it. And um, right off the gate, I want to talk about this amazing term force majeure. Um, which was a which was about um, a half a chapter in law school um, that you breezed right through because obviously it's not going to come up that much, and now you cannot go online and see every any law firm's website without seeing the term force majeure. So I want to start right off with Elizabeth and and discuss Elizabeth. What is the concept of force majeure? And what are the differences from a typical force majeure clause in the commercial context versus a government contract? Sure. So force majeure means superior force in Latin, and it's a common type of clause in many commercial contracts that excuses performance under the contract when certain extraordinary events or circumstances beyond the party's control arise. It, Force majeure clauses commonly cover specific events like war, or strike, riot, fire, or they cover categories of events. And the most common one is the term acts of God, which generally refers to hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, and that type of event. Um, some force majeure clauses in the commercial context further specify that performance is excused only when these types of events that I've mentioned make performance 
either commercially impractical or impossible or illegal. And again, these clauses are fairly common in commercial contract co commercial contracts, um, but how they're applied varies very widely. And that's dependent on the exact language that's used, again, whether it covers specific events or categories of events, and then also the state law that's being applied. There's actually a, pretty significant discrepancies state by state on how these clauses are interpreted. But in the government contracts context, um, the, the term force majeure does not appear in the federal acquisition, acquisition regulation in the FAR. Um, but a similar concept is reflected in a number of FAR and DFARS provisions. For example, FAR 52212-4, which is contract terms and conditions for commercial items, contains an excusable delay provision that states that contractors are liable for non-performance unless that non-performance is caused by an occurrence beyond the reasonable control of the contractor and without its fault or negligence. It then lists examples and includes that term acts of God or the public enemy, acts of the government, and that's either in the government's sovereign capacity or contractual ca capacity, and other instances of fires, floods, epidemics, as is relevant here, quarantine, strikes, severe weather, this type, these types of events. Uh, another FAR clause sort of touches on this force majeure uh, concept is 52249-8, which is a default provision related to fixed price supply and service contracts. And that provision similarly states that contractors shall not be liable for excess costs if their failure to perform arises from causes beyond their control and without their fault and lists epidemic among its examples. So again, that would be relevant here with this pandemic. Yeah, that's and we'll talk more. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I know, I know John's going to walk us through the details of that clause when, when we get to the, the version that I'm familiar with, which of course is the, the cost reimbursable version, version under 52-249-14, excusable delays. Um, but it's important that folks know for their different contract types that they're, as Elizabeth identified, there's different clauses that you're going to be looking to depending on what contract type, what type of instrument uh, you're under. Um, and so that's important because obviously um, we're talking about contracts and these FAR contract clauses. What about when it comes down to other transaction agreements? And so um, obviously other transactions agreements, my area of expertise before I left the government and continues to be an area that I'm very interested in. But let's take a look at force majeure because it does exist in typical OTA agreements. Um, OTA agreements are, are commercial agreements, at least on their face. If they're crafted correctly, they look more like commercial agreements. And therefore, no surprise that you would see a force majeure clause in another transaction. Here's an example of an actual force majeure clause that you will typically see across most DOD other transactions. This one happens to be a consortium uh, member ag agreement, but take it out of the consortium member con or consortium agreement context and, and it would look somewhat similar. Um, I think the key piece for folks that are operating under another transaction agreement is don't go to these FAR clauses for your remedies you need to go to the body of your agreement, find your force majeure clause if it exists. There are agreements out there that are, are absent on any language regarding force majeure. But if your agreement does have it, it will most likely look somewhat like this. And you need to note that while this is at the consortium management firm level, you can see that the consortium member is protected by the clause as well. Um, the other piece that I wanna call to attention in this quite typical OTA force majeure clause is that it protects against any cause or causes beyond the control of the parties. That says any, any cause or causes. And then it has including but not limited to, and we have a list, but we said including but not limited to. So whether COVID-19, coronavirus, uh, a pandemic is included or not, 
Well, maybe we can read it into this language. Obviously, we left the door open to look at it. Um, so a key, key piece in your OTAs is you need to go to the body of the agreement and not go to these FAR clauses because uh, they are not going to apply to it. If you are one of those folks who is operating under an OTA that is silent on force majeure, um, do not count on the Christian doctrine to read it in as these documents are not subject to the FAR um, and the Christian doctrine does not apply. Even if it did, there would be no clauses to make mandatory because there are no mandatory clauses for OTA. Uh, so the key here for OTAs, just like commercial agreements, you need to read the body of the agreement. Uh, force majeure is not a gap filled uh, term within OTAs. Um, so let's get down dirty and start talking about how these actual excusable delay clauses look. And for that, I'd like to go to the next question. And so this one for John, John, in the federal contracting context, can you explain the concept of excusable delay? And specifically, does 52249-14 apply to this current situation? Yeah, sure, Ben, thanks. And, and fortunately, the first question there you gave me is pretty easy because an excusable delay is exactly like it sounds. So it's a delay in your ability as a contractor to perform the contract. And that delay is excusable, meaning you as the contractor are not gonna bear the responsibility for the delay. So in other words, and Elizabeth was mentioning a couple of the other clauses and we've given you in the, the chat box, the citations to these clauses, that operate to essentially excuse you from uh, defaulting on performance of the contract when these excusable circumstances arise. And fortunately uh, for this particular circumstance, epidemic and quarantine restrictions, you'll see in the clause here on the slide, are two of the circumstances that would uh, represent an excusable delay. So if you are uh, prevented from performing the contract uh, per the schedule, you know, the deliverables, whatever it was uh, that you're supposed to do by when you're supposed to do it, uh, if you are experiencing one of these circumstances, and we're all experiencing uh, some very unique and crazy circumstances right now based on this epidemic, then that should prevent you from being in default of the contract. The, the delays you may experience should be excusable. Now, Ben mentioned uh, that, and Elizabeth as well, that you know, there are a lot of different clauses that address this. So we've got 52249-14 up here. Elizabeth mentioned a couple others. There are a few more. Uh, it's really important then that you have to look in your contracts to understand what clauses are in your contracts. That's first and foremost. Uh, ben mentioned the idea uh, or the concept of reading a clause into a contract. The, a, a court could do that under what's called the Christian doctrine. Um, if it's a mandatory clause and it's something that is so significant or deeply ingrained in uh, procurement policy that it should have been in your contract and it was just a mistake, frankly, that it was left out. Uh, I, I think these types of clauses we're talking about here, excusable delay provisions, default provisions, uh, should be read into your contract if they were left out. Uh, but it's important to start there. What, what's in your contract? So that's one of our exercises right now as contractors is we got to understand the terms that we're operating under and then we'll know how to move out from here in dealing with these really unique circumstances that we're encountering. The, the other point I want to make on excusable delays is that it's not good enough just that you've identified this clause in your contract and that we all know we're having an epidemic. In other words, like COVID-19 is not just a mic drop moment for you on your contract and you can feel free to get uh, the deliverable turned in whenever you get around to it. Uh, you need to have detailed documentation to support how this epidemic is impacting your performance. So that could be documenting like which particular staff of yours are affected or how your overall company and office and personnel are impacted. It could be 
in your supply chain, the delays that are being experienced, um, and that there's no alternative means for you to perform the contract, that you, you have no workaround. So you, you're, you have no choice but to have this delay. Or perhaps there is a workaround, but it might be a more expensive means of performance, in which case you might have a claim or a request for equitable adjustment to increase the cost of the contract as, as Elizabeth alluded to. I mean, that's really, I think, what a lot of contractors need to be preparing for right now. And this is, again, where having good documentation, details of exactly how you're being impacted are gonna go a long way towards both excusing the delays and avoiding a default, but also potentially establishing the basis for an REA or a claim down the road. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. Um, and, and I think that really piggybacks into something that I, I, I wanna make sure we get out to this audience. And, and for this, I'll turn to Mark. Uh, Mark, it, I started off by giving a little context on how we came, this uh, you know, panel came to be about a week ago. Um, and really, so the, the question that, that I'm asking is, so for those companies who acted preemptively, uh, for those folks that, you know, are self-quarantining and those folks that said, you know, I know I'm on the hook to prepare this event, but it just doesn't make sense. You know, there's some early actors that came before anyone was quarantined or any of these official orders or non-travel orders were going out or, or any of this stuff was out there. And they were just making proactive decisions that, hey, we just think it's smart to go ahead and not perform. Um, it, that sounds like a great idea for public health, probably a little more treacherous in the contract arena. So really my question is, if companies act preemptively in these situations and they self-cancel performance or repudiate their responsibilities, what issues does that cause? And in, is it possible for companies to insure themselves against these uh, you know, type of events and, and, and be able to, um, include that as an allowable cost in their, in their contracts with the government. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, those, are, uh, those are great questions um, and, a, and a great setup. And I think that's kind of the way uh, that I look at it as well, which is, which is let's start from the risk perspective uh, that, that these companies and the, these, uh, we'll say early adopters uh, may expose themselves to by uh, by actually going forward and preemptively canceling their performance or, or um, taking those sorts of actions to prevent their ability to perform uh, their contractual obligations. Um, and, and the main risk is that what they're actually doing is uh, something called anticipatory repudiation. Uh, if they come out uh, affirmatively and make a definite statement to uh, the government um, that they are either unable or uh, unwilling to perform their contractual obligations and they don't have cause for that yet, uh, then that can provide the government the, uh, the basis to terminate the contract for default. Um, and usually that's, that's what would happen is, uh, is when a contractor uh, anticipatorily repudiates its, its contract, the, contracting officer will go forward and issue a formal termination for default um, and and the process then moves down uh, the line and that uh, in the normal way terminations uh, default terminations proceed um, for, at a theoretical or technical level uh, the default has occurred with the anticipatory repudiation itself uh, and so um, although the, the contractor may have a limited window within which to retract uh, that statement um, and, and pull it back if the government hasn't taken any action relying on uh, the government's, uh, or I'm sorry, the contractor's statement that it will not perform, um, then, uh, then the, the government, you know, it's still defaulted even if, the, even if the contractor tries to pull it back. So looking at it from a worst case 
uh, scenario perspective, uh, affirmatively canceling uh, or, or, or making those sorts of statements to the government um, or taking actions that, uh, that indicate uh, that, that definite unequivocal uh, manifestation of intent not to perform uh, certainly can open a contractor up to significant risk. Um, now, taking a step back from, uh, from that uh, kind of doomsday scenario, there are certainly aspects or steps that contractors can take uh, rather than preemptively take pr proactively. Uh, engaging the government uh, ahead of time, early in the in the process, uh, it, describing uh, the w what the contractor at that point can foresee coming down the line, uh, and engaging the government and and hopefully some some uh, creative uh, problem solving communication. Um, it's it's perfectly acceptable for a contractor to approach the government about canceling the contract um, in terms of a discussion. Uh, it is, it's where the contractor uh, frames it as, a, as that definite unequivocal statement that it, that it is canceling uh, that, that crosses that legal line uh, into the anticipatory repudiation. Uh, and so taking those, those sorts of early steps uh, to engage the government um, and address those issues and talk about potential uh, solutions, um, even to the point of, of um, uh, suggesting and trying to negotiate an early termination for convenience um, and, and those sorts of, of actions uh, will result in generally better outcomes than, um, uh, than either simply waiting to see what happens uh, or affirmatively um, uh, making those statements of, of uh, non-performance. That's a great point. So, so, you know, we got some folks who, and I know in, um, you know, especially with all the events that, that went down in the last seven days, I don't know that we've ever seen something go down this quick from, from, hey, we may have some cancellations to, hey, your, you know, your kids are living with you for, for the next four weeks and you're their teacher. Um, you know, quite a, quite a shift here in the last seven days. Um, a lot of these companies that were out there to, to provide these types of services for the government and were trying not to have these large groups of people, obviously they should have been in touch with their counterparts on the government side. On the industry side, they're still on the hook for a lot of contracts. Um, so as, as, it, as it pertains to both the government and industry, how can a company insure itself uh, for these types of events? And, and is that allowable cost for its government contracts? Yeah, thanks, Ben. L let, me, um, let me take a step back from insurance uh, briefly to, to just mention, I think that um, contractors should definitely in these sorts of situations as they're determining at the outset how to proceed, think about whether they may have um, uh, ways, uh, w whether they may have legal bases uh, to, uh, to get out of those contract uh, obligations um, uh, without bearing the liability. Uh, and so they should look at instances where, uh, where circumstances may cause uh, performance to have become um, impossible, commercially impractical, those sorts of things. Um, and so you definitely want to look at those at the outset. Um, and to the extent the, the uh, contractor uh, has indications and, and the government actually takes the first affirmative action to affect the ability to perform, uh, the contractor may be in a, in a better position. And so balancing those interests at the outset when these sorts of issues uh, are starting to arise, those are some of the key considerations um, that are really important to, uh, to spend time on. Uh, moving forward into uh, forward into into much earlier in the process, um, which is which is uh, insurance uh, possibilities to, to provide a backstop um, uh, when you know in, in in the event that these sorts of issues are going to arise, uh, there are a variety of insurance products uh, that are available uh, to companies um, that help protect uh, against losses occurred. 
uh, incurred through uh, these sorts of, of scenarios. Um, many of the, of the attendees today are likely familiar with things such as business interruption uh, or contingent bin, uh, business interruption, uh, which are insurance coverages that, uh, that provide um, uh, the insurance where uh, a company suffers uh, losses due to uh, damage to property. Uh, and the, under the business interruption uh, coverage, the damages to the, the policyholder's property itself, and under contingent business interruption, the, law, the property damages to uh, a supplier or somewhere in the chain to their property, uh, and, and that those property damages uh, affect the, uh, the business's ability to perform and, and the cost to perform. Um, some issues with, with those in this sort of an instance, though, and why those insurance coverages may not provide uh, the, the panacea that we would hope uh, is that in most instances, uh, policies uh, in, in that vein require that, uh, that physical property has been damaged and that it is that damage that causes uh, the, the monetary loss. Um, and, and mostly what we're seeing right now is not actual physical damage of, of property. Um, the, there may be some windows there if perhaps contamination um, can, be, can be seen as physical damage, but, uh, but those are definite uh, fact intensive um, and widely varying based on the insurance policy, uh, the state law that might cover it uh, and those sorts of issues. Um, another issue we see is, is uh, insurance policies, just like uh, you know, all of our um, you know, standard automobile uh, coverages come with a, a host and variety of exclusions. Um, one common example of an exclusion in, in insurance for many uh, event-based scenarios is uh, loss stemming from communicable disease. Uh, and so again, if you've got that sort of an insurance policy, um, and in a scenario like this, uh, where you may be anticipating coverage, it's really important to pay attention to uh, what those exclusions are and how those may, uh, might fall out. There's several other various uh, specific insurance coverages that may be available to companies um, and uh, similar to the commercial setting uh, that uh, Elizabeth was discussing earlier with, with determining the, the, the specific coverage of a force majeure clause. It's going to be vital to pay attention to the specific insurance policy, the specific circumstances involved, and, and the, the law under which that policy would be uh, reviewed to determine uh, its coverage. So uh, at the end of the day, theoretically, yes, there's, uh, there is the possibility that insurance coverage uh, may cover some of a contractor's losses here, um, but there's a lot of pitfalls along the way that will have to be navigated to determine uh, whether it's actually covered. All right. Uh, I would think one, one of a really important thing to note about the difference between commercial force majeure clauses and government contract clauses is that the government contract clauses don't generally excuse performance entirely. There's some carve outs there, but the, the, the primary purpose of force majeure clauses in the commercial context tends to be complete uh, ex allowance for excusive performance, which would trigger certain insurance considerations compared to a, just an excusable delay or some type of compensation um, for the impact on the government contract. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Elizabeth. And, and I would say the other piece of that is, uh, as John was talking about with excusable delays, um, the, the clauses we've specifically been addressing with excusable delays address just that, the, the excusable delay, the, the extension of the schedule to perform essentially. Um, and, and where a delay may be excusable and a contractor may have additional time to perform, it, it may not actually be entitled to additional compensation uh, for the costs incurred due to that delay. That's a, that's a, a separate but related analysis that would have to be uh, undertaken. Yeah, absolutely. In, in, in the example of these event-based contracts where, where vendors are kind of in the middle, um, you know, obviously um, a delay isn't going to help, right? The, the event's been canceled. Um, so really we're looking at a, a frustration of purpose scenario 
in which the subject matter, the principal subject matter of the contract is to, is to put on uh, an event or, or host within an event, host, host services within an event. And if the event is canceled outside of the control of those parties, um, they're probably looking more at a frustration of purpose scenario than at any kind of delay, excusable delay. There, no amount of delay is going to help unless you're going to push it out to the next year, I suppose. Well, they're, they're still talking about rescheduling the Masters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, golf is six yards away from somebody in golf. We should be all right. <laughs> Maybe hey, we'll ben. get August August madness instead of March madness. Right. There we go. There we go. So, ben, ben, you had asked one other, one last question on the insurance piece, uh, and, and that's, that was just if the if the cost itself uh, for the insurance uh, would be allowable. Um, you know, I'll spare a, a, a full um, delving into uh, the cost principles, but uh, at a general level, um, insurance coverage is an allowable cost under the FAR. It's FAR 31-205-19. Um, and uh, obviously, there are some nuances involved here. But essentially, if the insurance coverage is, is either uh, required or uh, specifically allowed under the terms of the contract, okay, certainly that's going to be allowable. Um, or if it is, if it is uh, just in general a sound business practice uh, and the rates and premiums are reasonable, uh, then, uh, then those coverages generally will be allowable. All right. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point for folks in that type of industry. I mean, we can assume that they understand what the typical insurance coverage is for those event type services. Um, so I, I want to get over to John because we need to give some people, we need to give some people some tips on how to, how to actually work through some of these scenarios. Um, and, and I know we've touched on this, you know, here and there, but I'd really like to, to put it to the panel to talk about some practical steps. Uh, and I've kind of broken this up into two pieces. And the first piece is really on, on the immediate, like today, this week, next week. Uh, and so I'll start with John. John, what immediate actions should vendors be taking today to protect themselves in this environment? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I mean, I think the first thing, and it probably goes without saying, is to take care of your people. You know, make sure that you're providing a safe workplace, that your people know to stay home if they're sick, you know, that they understand what your telework policy is. I mean, there are a lot of HR employment issues that I think is job number one for contractors right now. But a close second, or maybe a 1B, is, you know, how, how do we keep things going on our contracts? And how do we line up our obligations to our employees with our obligations to our customers. And we've talked about it already, but I think it's worth reiterating. The number one point there is to look at your contracts, to understand the rights and obligations, which clauses are included, uh, et cetera. And we got a question uh, from one of the attendees about if you're performing primarily on task orders, and those tend to be maybe kind of thin in terms of incorporated clauses, I would expect in, in all cases that these task orders are subject to the terms and conditions in the master IDIQ contract. So I would go to your master IDIQ contract and look for, you know, what, what clauses are included. Is there, you know, which default clause is it? Is there a stop work order provision in the contract? Uh, is there an excusable delay provision? It's really important to understand you know, what, what obligations and rights you have right now. And, and that goes to another question that we got about sort of a unique circumstance where you might be an essential contractor. And there, the questioner asked about a specific DFARS clause that uh, requires if you are an essential contractor, you have to have a plan in order to uh, tell the government how it is that you're going to keep these essential services going during the crisis, you know, in this case, the epidemic. So uh, there is a, a part of that clause that, that gives you the ability to go to the customer and say, look, even though I'm providing uh, essential services and I'm supposed to give you a plan of how I'm going to keep things going here, I've got some challenges and you know, the government 
it, at least the way the clause is written, should work with you towards finding a way that you balance the challenges you're facing with the need to keep the services going. But that really requires having a conversation with your customers. So I think that's the next point on the list is talk with your, your customers, talk with your contracting upstream and downstream partners, you know, vendors, subcontractors. I think communication is really key right now. And you know, when you're talking with your customers, are, are you going to have a work stoppage? Is there going to be an actual stop work order issued? Or is there constructively a stop work order because you can't access the facilities anymore? You know, how can you work around these challenges, especially in the event that you are a contractor that provides essential services, or uh, even if not essential, the, you know, the objective is to keep the work going. So how are we going to work around that? Uh, the maybe office closures or people having to telework, et cetera, so, uh, you know, communicating. Uh, it's really important that you make those decisions in a vacuum, that you do that uh, with your customers and your partners in the loop because of the potential for claims and REAs here, these communications with the customers and upstream and downstream partners will also really help to set the stage for potential claims that you might have. And with that in mind, my last point here would be to document everything, uh, you know, keep, keep good records of uh, these communications and what the government's instructing you to do, what you're hearing from subcontractors about availability of supplies or workforce, uh, you know, potential increased costs that you might be encountering as a result of having to shift gears and how you were performing, you know, try a new approach in order to keep the services keep the lights on, so to speak, you know, all, all of that could be the basis for a claim or a request for equitable adjustment. Um, and, you know, knowing the rights in your contract, so going back to one of my first bullet points, that also impacts the timing of when you submit a request. So uh, under the uh, some clauses, you may need to submit a request for adjustment uh, within 30 days after the work stoppage ends. So you want to make sure you understand the timing requirements around, uh, you know, your, your contract clauses that might give you the right to request additional money. And I guess one more point, I, I just said the documenting was my last point, but for the small businesses out there, Keep in mind that the SBA, the Small Business Administration, has a few ways that they might be able to help. They have what's called procurement center representatives, or we call them PCRs. And these folks can help to intercede on your behalf with procuring agency officials if you're running into any challenges in terms of how to handle the situation and what's going on on your contract especially if it's an 8A contract, then you have the SBA 8A office that is uniquely involved with the way those contracts are awarded. So keeping SBA in the loop and seeking help from them if you need it uh, is one way to use them. And they also have an office of disaster assistance that provides disaster assistance loans. And uh, they can be up to 2 million that can be used to pay for fixed debts, payroll, you know, things like that uh, at a fairly low interest rate and, and can be up to 30 years, uh, depending on the specifics of the, your situation. So um, for the small businesses out there, keep those additional points in mind. Yeah, fantastic points. Um, and before I turn it over to Elizabeth and Mark um, to, to speak on same topic or others, um, I, I will give you the, I'll give you the career contracting officer perspective on this, which is our audience today is about half and half government and in industry. So we have a, we have a very robust audience for this of folks that are trying to stand, understand the issue on both sides. Um, and I can tell you from being a contracting officer who was mission essential and would have been in the building for this today. Um, the, the communication piece is so key because vendors need to know what actions to take and they need to know how the contracting officers want to play these situations. Um, I would, I would like to say that we've practiced enough for this. 
uh, with multiple shutdowns over the last decade. Um, I think that the government has gotten plenty of practice on what to do in the situation where non, you know, performance becomes impossible or difficult on the vendor side. And yet with the turnover in federal acquisition professionals, it seems that we have to relearn this uh, each time. And then to also be confronted on a situation like today, which is, which is really completely, it's a new thing, even though it definitely mirrors some of the, some of the legal aspects of the shutdowns over the years, uh, this is gonna be more of an extended uh, period. So you need to reach out to those government contracting officers you need to discuss what, what the possibilities are. Um, during my time as a, a contracting officer, I wrote many a letter to allow contractors to telework, um, sometimes to the chagrin of my, uh, my federal govies next to me who weren't allowed to telework at the time. Um, but the reality is you need to come up with creative solutions so that you can continue to have these contracts move along and so that you can avoid delay. Missions still need to be met. And of course, you know, I spent my time at, at uh, DOD, just like Mark spent his time as a Army JAG and, and the mission must continue. Um, so government contracting officers, hopefully all of your CORs have your cell phone number and you're coming up with a plan contract by contract on, on what those terms look like and how you're going to deal with it. Um, you've heard some of the questions we heard today from vendors which are really how to deal at the task order level, what clauses will apply. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to how those contracting officers uh, work with the vendor community to come up with solutions. Um, so that's my public service announcement to all our govies on the phone today. Um, get with those CORs, map out the, that contract portfolio that you're in charge of and see how the terms are uh, spread across. Um, and I know KOs or KOs or, or PCOs, depending on uh, whether, where you're coming from, are strapped. And I mean, a lot of COs, KOs are, are managing up to 60 some task orders or contracts and you probably have a lot of work to do, but lean on those CORs. Um, let me pass it off to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you can either finish us out here along with Mark on, on what you think the current steps our vendors should take or, or what are some uh, steps that folks should be taking to plan for the future? Sure, one thing I really wanna point out um, with regard to John's very good point that you know it should be communi communication, communication, communication and document, document, document right now is that the communications, if they amount to a, a change or a modification to the contract, stop work order, a contract action, then there needs to be documented communication from the contracting officer, not from, you know, technical representative or program manager on the government side. And this is one of the things that will trip people up later when you're, when you're considering a request for equitable adjustment or a claim is if you are following instructions from someone other than the contracting officer, you may have an issue. So I think what tends to happen on the government side, is, as you mentioned, the, the KOs are so, so strapped right now that someone tries to step up and solve this problem, but um, the, the contracting officer needs to be looped in and there needs to be documented approval of something that amounts to a stop work order or a suspension or a delay or some other modification to the contract. So that's absolutely essential for, for industry people and it should be something um, to note for the government folks as well. And Mark, if you have any additional points on this, I, 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 it would behoove us before we, before we get to the end of this webinar uh, to get your final comments on, on how to plan for the future, but also if you could address um, a comment, a situation that came up for me, I don't know how many times over the year, whether it was on CR or stop work or, hey, I live in Michigan, how about snow days impacting performance? Um, but what about on-site contractor personnel? So we're gonna have a, a ton of on-site contractor personnel, uh, facilities are closed. What are their options? Well, I think, uh, thanks, Ben. I think their, their options um, 
really fall uh, the, uh, in line with the rest of the, the conversation here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of, of flexibility. Un, unlike a, a government shutdown, um, in many ways right now, the government work continues. Um, and so to the extent the contractors personnel have the capability to continue um, through alternate means, uh, then those are, those are options that should be part of that communication with the, with the contracting officer. Um, as uh, I, I think John was mentioning, um, uh, the continuity of services uh, contracts uh, where, where the part of the contractual agreement was that the contractor would continue um, in, uh, in these sorts of situations. Uh, certainly there should be that plan in place um, and, uh, and it should be um, implemented in coordination with the government um, as, as you know, this situation draws in from a variety of, of, uh, ver of different uh, interruptions we faced uh, in other circumstances, including the the, uh, the government shutdowns and uh, and other other disasters or weather events. Uh, in that regard, um, the, the the key really is that communication uh, with the government as far as how that work can proceed uh, and how the government or how the contractor can continue to support um, and fulfill its obligations to the best uh, that that the parties can figure out right now. Yeah, that's, yeah I, I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in. I agree totally with what Mark just said. And I, you know, I, I think what we're probably going to start seeing coming up later this week, I think we've already seen some of it today, is that there are going to be more government sites that are going to mandatory telework as well. So it's been something that's, I think, largely to this point been led by the contractors and the commercial sectors getting out in front of teleworking. First, there was an article in the Washington Post this morning about how in that environment, uh, isn't it interesting that all the government folks are still having to show up to work? And I think that's been answered here today. I've heard just anecdotally from my wife who works for the government that they're now on mandatory telework for the next three weeks or so. So I think we are going to have contractors like this question on the slide that are either constructively or actually facing a stop work order. And so then that raises challenging questions, just like you probably had to encounter a little over a year ago with the last government shutdown. You know, what do you do with your people when the work is shut down? Do you have something else they can do in the meantime? Um, do, how long do you keep them idling until you have to lay them off? And I think that's going to have to be sort of almost a day by day question in some instances and for uh, some contracts and depending on, you know, the unique skills that that people on your team have, it, it, it might make sense and you may have the basis for an idle labor claim that you paid essentially to keep them on standby for the government. Other types of personnel and other types of contract work that people may be doing uh, would not as readily justify an idle labor claim. So uh, they may have to look at layoffs uh, sooner than than other folks. I think, that unfortunately, this is where we're going to be for a lot of a lot of the contractors. Yeah, and, and, so and contractors, I think, need to realize that you know they need to mitigate any costs that they're incurring to the extent possible. So the boards of contract appeals if they're even considering an idle labor claim, we'll look to see whether the contractor made every effort to assign that the individuals that issue to another contract or to somehow stop the bleeding on the cost that they're incurring while that work first was waiting uh, to restart work on the original contract. Absolutely. Yeah, I, so a question that's come up a couple times and, and I think we've gone over the answer, but I want to make sure we hit it because it's come up again in the chat. Um, so for those personnel uh, who work in classified environment or special programs, um, you know, it, it, that don't have access to the facility, um, you know, obviously they're going to have issue performing on those contracts. Um, anything special here or, or we're, they're just idle until there's access to those facilities? 
I think that's probably the case. I mean, I'm, I don't know if Elizabeth and Mark have different thoughts. I mean, you know, communication with the customer, maybe in some instances, there's a workaround, a way that you could telework a solution, but most likely uh, you're going to be constructively or actually stopped work until you're able mm -hmm. to get back to the facility. Yeah, and I know. It, yeah, I, know. I think that's the reality of the situation is that you're certainly looking at a, an excusable delay for performance. And in this situation, you're likely going to be either getting a, an actual stop work order or a constructive work stop. Yeah. And, and so working under those, obviously, you know, I, I know Mark has experience and I've worked in that environment during my career. Um, would you recommend, you know, just understanding that, really work becomes an impossibility because if you can't get to the facility, you, you can't even be talking about the fact that you can't get to the facility um, uh, for special programs. Uh, is this a, an area where the contractor should be engaging to get a stop work? Do we want to get that documentation rolling as soon as possible so that, so that we can start planning? I, I, think I would think you would, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I, I was going to say I, I I definitely think this is this is the area for that communication, um, right? And, uh, and and I think the affirmative notice from the government provides more protection generally uh, than uh, than than waiting and and, uh, and and you know not having that direction from the government. Um, you know, the other thing to, to think about um, in terms of, of customer relations, and, and this was going to be a, a point on kind of what, uh, you know, just to further elaborate on the comments that, the, you know, one of the top things folks should be doing right now is the communication with the, with the government is, is some, you know, in, engage in the creative um, problem solving uh, on on the contractor side, take some of that pain, right? The the government folks are are dealing with, um, you know, significant issues, and and contractors are as well. But uh, oftentimes, you come up with the best solutions when you create them, um, and so. Uh, for the contractor to spend the the energy to come up with creative solutions, uh, engage in the classified uh, setting. Uh, certainly, if the government won't provide access to uh, the area where the material is worked on, uh, whether it's a skiff or otherwise, uh, there's there's not a whole lot the contractor can do with that specifically. Um, but depending on uh, on the type of information that's involved, um, there are spaces that are uh, that are accredited that can be leased. Um, is that an option that the government would be interested in? Is that an option the contractor would be interested in? Is there, is that, uh, will that allow some work to continue? Um, but the, the initial point is, what is the government's contingency plan here in, in whatever setting you're facing? Um, and sticking with the classified setting, what is it that the government is doing? Are they simply locking uh, the facility and, and going home for, for the next month? Um, or are they engaging in whatever work they can and what is that work? Um, and how can the contractor uh, support that work in a way that, uh, that helps accomplish the mission and helps protect the contractor's um, uh, ability to keep working and, uh, and keep, paying, uh, get, keep getting paid? Um, and, and then you're, you're providing that solution to your customer. Uh, you're being that valued partner. Uh, you have a better chance of getting the solution that you want um, and the better chance of getting uh, your costs covered at the end of the day. Hey, Mark, this is Frank. I want to just punch in there and echo a few of your comments. I'd spoken to a contracting officer last week who uh, manages a lot of contracts for classified and secure work. And, and he sort of said the same thing. He said, don't be afraid to make recommendations, uh, be creative, offer solutions to your, your contracting officers or your cores. They are looking for that from their contracting workforce right now. So do not be shy about that. Uh, we had uh, a, a Q and A come in just a moment ago from an audience member suggesting that some of their customers uh, where they do 99% classified work are shifting to uh, sort of a, a rotating staffing schedule, right, to, to reduce the number that are on site at any given period so that work can continue. 
that's probably something that contractors are going to have to prepare for. So, you know, reach out to your staff, let folks know that there, you know, is this option of sending people on and into the, into the environments, but just not, you know, everybody at the same time. A uh, Betty Harvey uh, so offers as well that, you know, they are looking at, or maybe she has an idea that potentially you could modify contracts uh, that even are, are, you know, classified or, or typically done in SCIF environments and say, look, is there anything that we could do, you know, whether it's reporting or, um, you know, writing new SOPs, getting training done, like what can we do at home during this time that doesn't require us to be on the facility? So everybody, I love the ideas here and I just wanted to make sure we sort of tied those together. Thanks. All right, so it's three o'clock. We definitely exhausted our time. People hung on long for this because uh, I think it was it was obviously on point for what's going on in the current environment. Um, I want to thank the panelists. It was fantastic conversation, and I know they they have even more points. I might have to sucker them into doing a, a follow up in a couple weeks to talk about the new issues. Um, fantastic panel. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, Public Spend Forum is going to continue to provide free content uh, going forward. Tomorrow we have a free workshop, a uh, three-hour workshop, um, to dive deep into government contracting. Uh, Wednesday, we, we are hosting the World Bank and their new Global Procurement Database launch. Um, all this can be found on the Public Spend Forum website. Um, and currently, I hope people will keep an eye out on that public spend forum uh, website where we are compiling um, the environment for biotech researchers and we're going to put out a big data push for all the companies and experts worldwide that are working on the coronavirus problem. Uh, something that we want to give back that has nothing to do with, with any of this topic, it's just something that we believe is important and we're working on and we kind of have all hands on that currently. Um, Frank, go ahead and close us out. And again, thank you very much, everybody.